When it comes to um, creating a, a person-centered system, uh, you, often there's, there's a lot of good, good talk around doing this, but in terms of actually how to operationalize it, you know, people aren't aware of the tools they can use to do this. Um, and, and commonly the system will default to the kind of what the system needs setting um, if you don't kind of force it to, 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 to focus on, on, on the kind of user. Um, and so in, around data sharing, for example, um, the way we like to conceive of it is if you think of the person at the center of a network of people sharing data, um, and, and there's a, a circle around that person of organizations trying to do things with them for that person. Then the path of least resistance for one of those organizations to share with another organization is through the middle of the circle, i.e. through the person. So the person is a, a point of integration. They are the only person involved in all of the interactions about them. Um, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a premise that says, uh, with their consent and giving them the power, they could share data far quicker and more readily and easily than all these other systems would do without them. Um, because the information governance and the ethical issues and the data protection issues and the privacy issues around one organization sharing data with other about someone are quite hard to deal with. Um, so giving a, the person an active role in that um, you know, could actually give us an easier <laughs> route to, to share data and one that, that, that empowers the person. Quite often when we do the kind of co-design work, we learn surprising things about the way people are you know, willing to manage their own data and you know, take an active role in the way that their, their care is delivered. Um, often when you are trying to change the system, you get uh, a kind of reaction that says, actually, we don't think people are capable of doing this, nor are they really that interested in doing it. It's quite a lot of work. Um, and, and so this is, this is part of the, kind of the patriarchal kind of mindset which says that the system knows best, let us handle it. Um, and um, the reality is with the right incentives and if you are, understand the person's life and what they value, um, there are ways of designing systems so that they are doing things that improve the quality of their life which also have a health outcome. So what we're not saying is monitor yourself with this wearable because it's good for you. What we're saying is what sort of technology would you use in your day-to-day -day life? You might use a wearable that allows you to easily swipe it and pay for something at a, at a, at a, at a checkout. Um, the fact that you then have done that gives us the ability with your consent to, to have data around your shopping habits, which we can use with you to help kind of nudge you towards healthier choices. But we're not saying the NHS is going to give you a thing that does that. We're saying, how can we work with with what you're doing, what, what is easy and useful in your life already, uh, and, 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 and work with that instead of introducing new technology for the sake of it from the NHS. In terms of the way that um, different sectors interact uh, around uh, digital innovation and health and care, um, uh, DHI as, as Scotland's Digital Health and Care Innovation Centre, our, our role is to act as a kind of facilitator and a melting pot, if you like, between academic uh, private sector and public sector um, actors and um, for us it, it's crucial insofar as um, our, our academic co colleagues usually have um, a, a long view in terms of the, the good of the system, understanding how to, to help the system improve and evolve over time. They also have a great skill set around uh, both developing and proving that things do or do not work. So you can get a really robust evidence base that helps with the change because people will not leap to something without a good, a good, a good case. Um, industry largely are more in tune with the kind of consumer drive, the understanding of what people want, how they want to live their lives, how they want to interact with digital services. And in every other work, walk of life, your know, industry has helped us do that. Where you know booking your own flights, you know, uh, you know finding um, restaurants near you, all these sorts of things. Um, so there's something we, we can tap into in each of those sectors, um, and there are also negatives around each of those sectors that they can, we can balance out. Um, so uh, the public sector is there for an ethical and universal access to services, which balances the consumer agenda, which is he who pays gets. You know, and so there's, there's, there's appealing bits of both of those worlds, and we need them to, to fuse um, uh, to, to get the most out of both systems. And then specifically around the way um, these sectors interact, um, the difficulty is everyone is moving at a different pace and people need a different kind of short-term impact in order to justify their contribution. Um, so what we need to try and do is figure out ways in which uh, industry can have a sustainable business model that doesn't conflict with the ethical and, and, and uh, you know, kind of set of responsibilities that public sector organizations have um, and probably can't be around selling data. 
Um, and so that would be my, my, my chief thing is understand the business model early or try and explore business model early so you don't get into a, a, a difficulty later when you, you get a kind of culture clash when the business model seems to work against uh, what the system is trying to, to, to do for the person. There's always been a uh, tension between rural communities that could really benefit from technology because of the bigger distances and the, the lack of, of, of as, as good an access to service as you might have in, a, in an urban environment. Um, there's a tension between that need and the fact that the technology and the business model around investing technology in an area isn't as good because there are fewer people. There are fewer people to, 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 to um, create a customer relationship with. So urban areas always get all the technology first because there's lots of people, um, but gain the least from it, relatively speaking. And so that, that's always been a kind of a tricky one. Um, basic connectivity, internet connectivity, you know, being case in point. Um, there are some emerging technologies, and I usually say technology is not the answer. You shouldn't let technology drive innovation. Strangely enough, it, you know, it should respond to need. Um, but in this particular case, there are an emerging set of technologies around connectivity, around networking, uh, that could be changing that dynamic. Um, and there's a particular one, without getting into too much of the technical detail, it's called low power wide area networking, which is effectively a cheap alternative to normal telecoms or broadband based connectivity, where you effectively put up masts with uh, a kind of gateway that, that, that um, that has a kind of five kilometer radius and you can get a very low uh, resource, low data rate connection to a wide area quite cheaply. Now you're not gonna be doing video conferencing over that or anything fancy, but if you just want to put a blood pressure reading into your GP, you can do that without the normal connectivity. So that's quite exciting in, in that you could see how local and rural communities could invest in quite cheap infrastructure themselves to get you know, these sorts of things working. Um, and so that's quite exciting in terms of democratizing access to some of these services. Um, and I guess the, the other piece around uh, the rural uh, component is um, a lot of rural environments are positioning themselves as great places to innovate because you can make the business case for change much more easily in a, in a rural environment. The, the cost benefit is almost, is almost always more favorable. So people tend to go there because the energy is better, there's more oomph in the system, there's more ability to actually make things happen, um, which can then be applied to urban environments, you know, once you already have a, a, good, a good amount of momentum built up.